Thank you all for coming, and um, I really appreciate coming out on a cold uh, December evening to listen to me. Hopefully, be interesting, but maybe not. Um, I want to talk about the title, but I'll talk about that in in a little while, um, because I think the the title really speaks to the dedication of this lecture. So if I do the dedication first, I think it will become more apparent. So today's lecture then is very much done um, in the spirit of Justice for LB. So we're using the hashtag Justice for LB and for all the young dudes. How many people here know about LB? Cool though, that's brilliant, that's really good. So that's a majority of people, but just in case you didn't, uh, LB, Laughing Boy, was a ferocious young dude who was a healthy young man who liked Eddie Stobart, who loved buses, uh, whom his mum wrote a brilliant blog about, My Dad's Life. And he's known as LB Online, but Thomas Barahoff is his name, and he has been, uh, his name has been out there. Alongside all his other talents, he had the label of autism and epilepsy. And he was sent to an assessment and treatment unit. And after 107 days, he died an entirely preventable death um, in a bath, uh, where he was left unattended. Um, shockingly, um, the death has had some positive activity, not least of all the death of Twitter action, the outpouring of love, uh, the social media activism and compassion, I think, that has grown out of the movement. Um, I think what's interesting is, well, over a year later, there has been no form of apology, um, there's been some quite atrocious, <coughs> inhumane and inhuman acts, I think, like reduction of text, surveying of social media, none of which gives us any real hope that they've taken responsibility and dealt with the incident properly. Um, however, we will return to Laughing Boy because his spirit uh, lives on and uh, the sense of co-production and collaboration and compassion which have featured in this campaign and he's got a brilliant set of activists, some of whom are here tonight, so welcome and I'm so glad you've come. Um, not least of all, his mum, who's been a brilliant activist. So, thank you for coming, and we return to Laughing Boy, it frames the talk. I should say something about, then, um, the talk, and, and thank yous, I think. Um, nobody from my immediate family is here, in terms of my, my mum, my mum couldn't come. But the day today, I chose the date of December the 4th, because it is my dad's birthday. And I thought it would be important to honour that date. Um, my dad ha has died, bless him now, but he would have been ferociously proud, I think, to see his daughter become a professor. My dad was a big advocate of education. He was the first of his generation in uh, the mining village to go away to Swansea University. And he loved education, although he did physics and maths. <laughs> That's limited, isn't it? <laughs> but, then, but I was going to say, he then did turn to the social sciences later in life when he did an open university degree. He was one of the first people, I think, in the country to do an open university degree. And down the working men's club, they used to say, Here's the three degrees coming. <laughs> he managed to get three degrees over his lifetime. Right? <laughs> Still couldn't screw a nail in, but he was. <laughs> anyway, what I got from my dad, and which has permeated, I think, through, is his love of education, his sense of argument, and his understanding of nuance and tolerance. So he would be really delighted that I'm here talking in this way. I'd hope my mum could come, but my mum is serious, seriously ill and can't come either. But I think from her, I get a real sense of inclusion. Her understanding of disability, um, her absolute desire to make places inclusive are very much about um, my mum and her front door policy. Our front door was never uh, closed, never locked. To this day I still haven't got a front door key to my own house because there is no need to have it. So, um, you know, pity my mum can't come but luckily Paul has come who's a family friend and thank you ever so much. Paul's worked tirelessly in the community around music and cultural participation and invigorated that in the small Welsh village where we come from. So thank you ever so much. So today's talk then, um, I'm going to say, um, first of all, I think that I'm 
rather like Morrissey said, the pleasure, the privilege is mine to do this, but actually all the debt and the thanks go to other people. So although I will be talking, you will pick up, I think, lots of what I'm saying really comes from people I have worked with. I, I wonder very much whether I've got lots of things to say which have solely belonged to me. I think they belong to others. Wanted to say a big thanks, and uh, I'll use the F word straight away, feminism. Um, because I, this slide says about towards a feminist politic, and I'm proudly, proudly feminist, but I would like to say I, I really am thankful to people who have supported me on the journey. This journey has not been done in isolation, so my partner Dan, who's been a conspirator in all kinds of ways of life, uh, my girls who are developing into feminists, even if they don't want to be, <laughs> <laughs> all the friends who's come from very different parts of my life, so thanks for to friends and workplaces I've worked before and students I've worked with. Thank you ever so much. I have learnt and uh, supported you, but I have learned much from working with you. So, so again, I, I do thank you. So thanks ever so much. One of the lovely PhD students who couldn't come tonight, uh, she's a creative practitioner. She did a lovely picture once, which I thought was very much about collaborative knowledge and communities of practice, which is an approach I really like to think through about ways of learning. And she said, she said after a while, can I, would you mind if I drew you? interpretation like a photo I said yes that's fine so she brought it along to the next session mm -hmm. and she done my curls with all ideas coming off the curls <laughs> and ideas going back in so and it was a lovely metaphor I thought and she, I, she, she said that's what supervision is like and I said yeah because you bring ideas they go into me and they come back out but I thought it was a lovely image of the way in which knowledge is truly very much connected and is a relational activity so in community psychology, we often say, what have you taught people, rather than what have you learned today? Because everybody is a teacher, and we all learn. We're all still learners. Uh, some of us slower than others, I think, now. <laughs> but we are trying to learn. Okay. I just wanted to say then, in collaboration and partnership, you can see this slide is, uh, works on a word lap, so it just takes text and represents the size of it. Relative, relative to the frequency of the word. And although my name's bigger, you can see the plethora of people that I have worked with. Um, and this is just some of the publications, but I'm very proud of the way in which uh, I have been working and thank you to people. Okay, so the strength of the bonds are there. Rather than having learning objectives, and luckily we haven't got to link them to graduate level, because <laughs> I'm not sure we'll be able to get any. <laughs> Today's session, we're going to be looking at the following. What does it mean to be human or humane? We're going to try and position some knowledge within a current context. We're going to share some collaborative knowledge, so I'm going to share some of the things I have picked up from working with other people. We're going to think about co-production, making things together, and then we're going to move towards, hopefully, co-professing in these revolting times, because I think it's an agenda where we need to all be together. Okay. <coughs> What is a professor, you might ask? Well, a professor is um, a scholarly teacher. Uh, the precise, precise meaning means a person who professes, an expert in arts and sciences, a teacher of the highest rank. In our university, um, they've really added something um, new or recognised something, which I think is quite important, which they're calling academic citizenship. And this is very much about the role that um, academics should play in public and civic life. So it's recognition of much more of a citizenship agenda rather than looking at one's own bottom and professing to oneself. So it's quite an interesting, um, I think, agenda uh, that, I, that I, I'll return to because I think that comes on kind of hand in hand with a very different version of professing, which isn't just about spouting one's own stuff. It's about thinking through what one needs to do. The, the thing I want to point out here is it, it's almost as if that, an expert, the knowledge belongs to that professor. And I, I would like to clarify that and query that and trouble that notion. Because I think knowledge usually is jointly produced and belongs to more than one person. So not entirely sure I have a body of knowledge. I have a big body, but I don't have a body of knowledge that I can actually use to profess. So we'll come back to that. One thing I do want to show you when I'm using some of this is that hopefully... Um, lots of things are connected. So I'm trying to get to the place where hopefully 
this will make some sense. We'll see. Okay? <laughs> Before we get there, I just wanted to think a little bit about what, what is humane. And I think what's interesting about when you look up humane, in order to be judged as humane, we often judge treatment against animals, which I think is quite interesting. So quite a fascinating idea about, yes, it's showing compassion or benevolence, but we often use it when we're talking about treating non-human species, which is interesting. The former meaning means it's intended to have a civilising effect <coughs> on people. And wouldn't it be lovely if we could manage to civilise people so that everybody was humane and showed humanity? It's not a difficult thing to do, but you would think it is, given some of the behaviours you see from people. Okay, so hopefully everything's, everything's connected. We shall see. I think one of the important things to try and uh, think about is looking at where we are now in this current context. Um, I am writing this in 2014 and I am a woman professor, which is quite a rarefied role and I realise I'm very lucky to have it. But um, we're writing in hugely unequal times. Uh, on this slide there's a scale where the men are more heavily weighted than the women. And uh, what we know about women in the academy is that they're in the minority as we go up into higher positions. So 78% of professors are men, 72% of senior managers are men, 80% of vice chancellors and principals in the UK are men. So it's a very rarefied environment. This is clearly a feminist issue. People who know me will be used to me saying that, I say it quite often. Now, but it's also one to do with race, disability, class and inequality more generally. And the figures are shocking around black in the academy. Blackness in the academy is even worse. So we, we are writing in hugely unequal times. If we move outside the academy and we look at what's happening um, in the real world, if there is a real world out there, the times are massively unequal, I think. And whilst we've had in the last couple of um, months some really useful, I think, social activism, which recognises indifference. So I'm thinking here of the gun violence and the racism in Ferguson. I'm thinking of the gender-related violence around Ched Evans and the Sheffield United footballer and the social activism that meant he got uh, demoted. Yay. Um, <laughs> the Francis and the Winter Winterbourne report and what's happened and the, the outpouring of love and the activism around justice for LB. It shows you that we're living, I think, in hugely unequal times, but also that people are prepared to fight for the human. People are really prepared to come out, nail their flag to the mast, and protect something about humanity. Um, whether we're looking at, um, at something like the 99% movement, or whether we're trying to read complex um, economic uh, discussions about it, what we do know is that there is rising inequality, and this rising inequality is problematic for our society. Um, one of the ideas that we've been using, I think, have been influenced by is Wilkinson and Pickett's spirit level. And uh, they use the, the idea that actually within country inequality is rising and that's what causes difficulty. Um, I'll come back to that because I've got a lovely infographic on it. Um, Michelle Fine talks very much about these being revolting times and revolting is something I think uh, something we can think through as both being in both meanings of the word revolting as in yucky, icky, achavi, as we say in Wales but revolting also as in resistant and pressing against and pushing and arguing so revolt as in resistance. Uh, if we look at what's happening across the globe we know that inequality gaps are, are getting greater and what happens is that neoliberal processes are dominating and deciding whose stories and whose voices can be heard. This has impacts upon evidence and research. It, it drives a research agenda around the type of research that can be done and what counts as evidence is getting more and more thought through. Um, what happens, I think, in this austerity measure is that the economic crisis has been represented almost as natural and inevitable. And then the natural concomitant from that is that we're all in this together, so it's fine, and we're all engaged in shared sacrifice. On every measure of social life, inequality gaps have, have risen, and um, the Wilkinson and Pickett argument, although it has critics, has documented how these gaps in inequalities 
have, have racialized and classed collateral consequences. So we know that um, these gaps jeopardize health, infant mortality, crime, fear, violence, civic participation, voting. We know that in America in 2007, the top 1% of Americans have 35% of the wealth. In the UK, the richest 1% are wealthier than the poorest 55%. A disparity that's been growing steadily since the 1970s. So, you know, we've got a massive journey ahead. This, this is an infographic. We don't need to understand it particularly, other than colour-wise. So, this is, these are people who've. Um, this is 2012, so it's two years out of date. But what it's showing you is the worst-performing countries in terms of inequality are the pink and the orange ones, which are the UK and the US. And they are showing you that um, they are the worst countries in a whole host of measures. Infant mortality, teenage pregnancy, life, life expectancy, uh, social mobility, trust, for example. Better performing countries tend to be Japan, Sweden, some of the Nordic settings. Okay. So there's an absolute price to, play for, for, to pay for some of this inequality. And something we need to be uh, mindful of. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to zip us forward 50 years into the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, 50 years in the future, and rather than, so I'm going to talk to you now about 2064. And there's a journal that I am now associated with, um, and it's got an impact factor of 7.8 in 2064. <laughs> because it's such an important journal. <laughs> the journal's called Community Work and Family, and I'm going to read from the introduction to the special issue. Okay? So I'm going to read some of this, I'm not going to read it, but stick to the plot. Right. The special issue is called Celebrating the Human. Welcome to this special edition of 2064 which celebrates 50 years of this journal, Community, Work and Family. This is a journal set up by two <coughs> feminist professors at a time when less than 20% of professors were women and less than 1% were black. In the, this is in the UK. In the early days, journal papers were written and submitted and printed in first paper copy and then latterly online. So oddly, people could choose which articles they wanted to read. The social times were hugely unequal but academics at Manchester Metropolitan, University of Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam, Chester, Leeds, Beckett, Salford, Lancaster, and other northern universities began to question and understand issues of the human. There was much work to undertaken around class, around migration, around poverty, around disability, and particularly learning difficulties, and this work was undertaken around largely issues of difference. A string of conferences around community psychology and normalcy, theorising normalcy, bucked the trend of sometimes only allowing particular people to talk at conferences. Um, and journals like this one included a section, Voices, which encouraged other contributions from other people. Ideas of globalisation, the inequality facing humanity and austerity measures meant that the human could not be divorced from the context. Bucking the trend to do well-funded STEM research, brain imaging work, and work which focused on the individual, this group of researchers maintained the need to be humane and engage in work which had an explicit set, uh, set of, of values. They used and valued a set of creative practices, uh, realising that flourishing was more, more than the absence of physical disease, that it was about wellness and the capacity to engage in civic life in all its forms. This group of researchers refused to engage in label bingo. They worked in collaboration. They as became a recognised body of work which tried to understand social objection and the revolting others, as Tyler has noted. They worked with disabled people's organisations, LGBT organisations, migrants, artists, music practitioners, mental health practitioners, and many with local organisations, Steady State Manchester being one or some of them even worked more globally in the Global South. Broadly, the agenda was minority agenda. Lots of people were not interested in this agenda. It had no big pharma funding, no brain scans, but a set of explicit social justice and stewardship values. It was a trend towards the humane because it had, uh, it was united in favour of people, in, in favour of the human. 
It's argued, argued against ways in which, at the time, the big society, which wasn't very popular, played out <laughs> and worked against agendas and wanted to kettle people and protest them. Hagen, for example, noted the need to bear witness and walk alongside in solidarity uh, in order to change and transformation. Fifty years later, this journal and the world of publishing have, now, have been configured very differently. Now we have apps which can deliver direct to readers all the content and indeed apps to work on these values. Community Work and Family has developed a specialist app which enables people to become more humane. Um, <laughs> this app gets sent to people straight down the line and it grows their humanity. <laughs> we recognise that this anniversary, the legacy of working in the hyphens, the belief that we can work together, and we're glad to note the paradigm shift which this early work enabled. As Tichkowski noted, it was a time when people needed to watch their watchings and read their readings, and this group made that possible with the legacy of being human and being humane. So, right, back, to the, back to now. <laughs> I should have thought about doing something like this. So, back, back to now, I suppose. This is, uh, this is just an infographic about Mark Zuckerberg's idea about social media and sharing. And we'll Twitter, Twitter beans about, uh, amongst you, Catherine Renter and Cole. If, if, if there's a Zuckerberg social media law applies to Twitter, we'll be tweeting over 50 million words a second by 2050. And if we get an app that can de deliver humanity, the world will be our oyster. We can, we can, we can change it. Anyway, back to the back to the present. I put a little joke in. I know people like jokes. The past, <laughs> the present, and the future. I walked into a bar. It was tense. Not bad, is it? <laughs> anyway, what? Would that we could write that future and, and enable shifts in thinking. And I guess my serious point is to say, would it be lovely if in 50 years' time we could look back and say there was a body of work which actually did do this and which changed and enabled thinking and transformative practice. So um, this, this work that we're doing, I think, is really important. Um, and I just want to touch now on some of the, some of the work that uh, I've been involved with. I, I think the, the envelope, if you like, if feminism is the bedrock of, of what I do, the, the, the quilt and the snuggle thing has been community psychology, because this has given me um, very much, I've learned so much from being at MMU, I, this is where I have learned my community psychology, it's given me the confidence to think through these things using a particular framework. Um, I'm going to read Bert Nettal's definition of community psychology, for those of you that aren't familiar, so, community psychology offers a framework for working with those marginalised by the social system that leads to self-aware social change and with an emphasis on value-based participatory work and the forging of alliances. It is community psychology because it emphasises a level of analysis and of intervention rather than the individual and their in immediate interpersonal context. It is community psychology, however, because it is nonetheless concerned with how people feel, think, act, experience as they work together, resisting oppressions and struggling to create a better world. So, um, Mark Burton and Karen Kagan, who are here um, tonight, and still writing into the fields, you can't believe people retired want to work so hard, <laughs> but they still do, and writing. <laughs> And one of the things they're writing about at the moment is the need to think through all these different crises, how these interlocking crises that we're facing, economic, ecological, demographic, energy crisis, how we manage to um, solve problems thinking about all these inter interlocking crises, given that we live in societies where the assumptions uh, predominate are around productivity and growth, are around exploitation of labour, so the global north to feed their consumerist habits, gains lots of stuff from the global south, um, particular forms of culture being um, prioritised over other forms of culture. So we've got lots of crises to solve and I just want to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've had the pleasure to be involved with. How am I doing for time? Thank you, that's all right. Okay, so one project I want to walk, uh, talk about and uh, Lisa, Lisa's here from Wyin, which is lovely, thank you. 
uh, is a project that we did in collaboration with uh, YN around issues of forced labour. So these are people who are often working um, under, a, uh, under a, a cloud, and the cloud might be around identity threat, might be working well below the minimum wage, they might have had their documents taken away. And we did this project uh, working in collaboration with YN, which is a Manchester-based innovative social enterprise. Um, and the work tries to show the ways in which Chinese workers wanted to work in the UK and just wanted to be human. So it very much speaks to questions of the human. Um, the stories uh, that we got were quite difficult. Families were often threatened. The debt of the people <coughs> to travel facilitators. So people came from China, often in, in the need to send remittances back. They needed to pay back the debt back to these snakeheads, the travel facilitators. Um, but they really wanted to stay here. They wanted to. The, the stories of sacrifice and devotion, we were very interested in their agency, in how they made those decisions. And we wanted very much to set them against a backdrop, understanding what had happened in China, and understanding that economic <coughs> decisions are rarely due to rational economic man sick. They're usually to do with familial decisions and networks of people. So we, we managed to, to work um, co-productively, so working in tandem to, to create this together. And uh, the Chinese researcher was embedded in Chinatown because Karen and I, the Chinese, is not up to much. So uh, we, we did workshops where we had lots of translation and back translation, um, and we used uh, our, our contacts, but we used ways of working together. So these, uh, in order to publicise the work, we also uh, developed an anthology to distribute around Chinatown, which had experiences of Chinese migrants in their own words, in both Chinese and English, to raise consciousness about this very hidden phenomenon. So the idea that people are working, sometimes under threat, um, in difficult circumstances. So the, the idea very much here is around uh, trying to work collaboratively in order to co-produce analysis and Indeed, all the outputs that we've had from that have been co-produced with, with joint authorship because we've been working on the analysis together. And it's a, it's a really good example of a project that we couldn't have done without their input. We wouldn't have been able to manage to even think of the ideas and we certainly wouldn't be able to manage to, to make sense of some of the Chinese analysis. So um, that's just a, a bit of work, I think. I'll just read out something uh, from one of the participants. So, the, st the stories of hard work and family <coughs> sacrifice, I think, show, them a bit, show the way in which people are trying to fit into their system, our system. Working with this precariat, we see ways in which human labour flows in air. So, Zua was a fisherman off the southwest coast of China, left his family, and joined a brother and other relatives in the UK. My wife, my parents, they definitely supported me to come here to earn money. Back home, family burdens are very heavy. My business had failed and I had debts. I came to my older brother and my family gathered several hundreds of money. Um, it really worried me as I got my wife and my children back home and I borrowed so much money when I arrived in Manchester. Anyway, my elder brother and my cousin were waiting to pick me up. I worked in my, work, my brother's workplace in the kitchen, washing dishes. I lived with my brother, many people. We lived together. When we lived together, it was cheap. He's talking about hot bedding for the working in, under those sorts of conditions. During the eight years he had worked in the UK, he supported his children through their education. One of his daughters had managed to become a university graduate and had then joined him in the UK to work. So commitments to his family enabled him to endure the hard work conditions. And the stories attested both to hard physical labour, but to the emotional labour that they were doing in order to make some of these sacrifices. So again, you can really see how they're working to become human, just to be recognised as human. Thomas would say. Okay. Another project that we worked on, which was led by uh, Jenny Fisher and Carrie Hagen, is we were um, commissioned to train some people uh, around community organising. And um, this proved quite challenging. Um, so uh, we could talk about this for, forever and ever, but what was interesting was we were trying to give an MMU slant, I think, on a big society um, a, a initiative. So we were trying to work using the principles that we were used to working with around community psychology, and we kept on coming up short against some of the 
the big society ideology about the way things should do. So they wanted to spirit people into areas where they didn't have any contact in order to mobilize people and to agitate. And we kept on saying, well, that's not going to make any sense. You need to work with contacts that people have got. So it was a, an, an, interesting, um, set, a, an in interesting project where we were trying to think through how best to support people, but also how to mobilize um, activism in some ways. We've also written about this using community psychology, using Imogen Tyler's work on revolting subjects to look at ways in which particular groups of people, migrants, poor people, benefit scroungers, the disabled, carry the weight and the burden of other people's horror. They become the non-human. They become the detractors that we must try and manage in some way in order to get through to the important stuff. So it's often seen as it's about them, those, these revolting subjects. Uh, that, you know, to, that come up and pop up in news stories all the time. So as community, when training community organisers, we were trying very much to try and get them to think through what some of these different messages they were picking up from communities was about. Okay, another project. This is a project that Catherine runs with Cole and Dan Goodley um, really led on. Um, I was part of it. But this is a really interesting project around uh, scope which was a disability charity, and they had wanted to understand the human in terms of individual resilience. So they wanted a project which was, how do disabled people become resilient? In fact, if we could get them into the Paralympics as well, that would be an added bonus. <laughs> but, um, more than ever, it was, what is it individually that disabled people have that we could, we could find out about? I mean, it was done in a supportive way. Um, but the, but what, we tr what we tried to do is to say, well, actually, resilience is a much more a networked idea. People are rarely going to be resilient as an individual attribute. It's not something you think you could have skills training in. So in this project, um, we were trying to think through a, a different way, a community psychology way of competence being distributed across different actors and across different networks of people across the life course. And I think successfully the project did do that. It repositioned resilience, not as something that individual <coughs> humans have, but as something about humanity, something about being humane, and something that other people share. So that was a, um, another interesting project that we've uh, we worked on and, and bore some fruit. And again, we worked collaboratively with Scope around that in, in doing some of the sharing of the projects as well. Um, the, the project that we're working on at the moment is a project that's done in quite a lot of uh, different partners. And this really takes <coughs> full production, I think, to a sensible place where what we're doing here is actually paying people for their time to work collaboratively on the project. So although we've had a, a massive mantra about um, engagement and participation and working with people, often we haven't been able to necessarily put the money behind that. So we're often asking community um, activists to come along to things and we've got no money to give them lunch. And now they can have toilet paper as well now we're in this room. <laughs> <laughs> but, but often we can't afford to pay them. But off, you know, it, so at least the building's in place. Um, but in this project, what is lovely, this is a project where people are getting money. The Men, Men Cup Foundation, Circles of Support, Speak Up, a self-advocacy group, uh, lots of people are getting money to actually work in a dedicated way on the project. So in this project, we're working with a range of organisations to try and explore how people who have the label of learning difficulties are faring in this big society. So this great agenda we've got, the, the promises of volunteering and work and coming off benefits, which have been promised as part of the big society, how they, they are, of course, simultaneously happening against a backdrop of cuts, which are making lives for lots of people more precarious, particularly those with learning difficulties. So this project looks very much at that type of, of idea. And uh, again, working in collaboration, whenever the project's gone to conferences, it's been very clear that people are co-producing and co-presenting. So the message very much is, we are working together. It's not our work to talk about. The work belongs to us all. So the belonging and the collaboration is seen in all strands of the research. So here is um, an artist, Robin Mead, who's taken some brilliant ways of making accessible. So he's 
he's drawn some, uh, he's drawn a representation of the project using barriers and work and things closing down to show ways in which big society cuts are happening. Um, so of course he's got paid for doing this, which is which is useful, but it also is useful as a communication tool. So you can see here that lots, lots of these ways of working are trying to engage. Um, working with Catherine and Dan, who are ferocious writers, I think they write in their sleep, um, <laughs> means that you've often got a job keep, keeping up. So they've generated a plethora, and it'd be useful if you are interested, look at the blog spot for this, because Catherine's done a really brilliant um, kind of beautiful, accessible sort of uh, WordPress site as well. And um, in, in this site, there are lots of ways which uh, demonstrate some of the collaborative ways in which we've tried to work, including videos and short interviews with partners, so you can actually see some of the, the work that we've done. Um, for each of the um, outputs, if you like, so we're thinking about some of the, um, the impact agenda. The impact agenda in universities now is to show that research does something useful, okay? Which I know you argue should have happened anyway, but now is written in stone and we have to show it, which is a good thing. And I think buys into this idea about public intellectuals and civic participation. But um, for each one of the outputs, we've actually got impact summary cards which link to some of the papers that we've done. So for example, in this one, which is around the human, okay, we very much um, show uh, some simple messages about this. So this one says, we found that historically not all people are considered to be fully human, as re recent examples of abuse and neglect have shown. New technologies mean we're living increasingly different times. This has been called the post-human condition. Disability is often part of discussions about what it means to be human. We suggest that disability demands we need to think differently about the human, so it allows us a moment of <coughs> relational ethics, it allows us a different space. A disability can shape how we think about our relationships and reshape trouble and expand on ideas of what it is to be a human. And I'm now going to show Catherine's brilliant animation. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> oh, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, that is where the technology will really go wrong. Thank you to Jenny Fisher teaching me. Yes. Oh, so oh, oh, oh.
were human or humane. We act instead in codified sort of pre-existing rigorous bureaucratic ways which don't make any sense. Um, I've, uh, I'm arguing and I've, I've learned so much from working with other people that I think there's a job of work to do which is about thinking back to values that you have um, and thinking about stewardship. Stewardship is not articulated in the literature, but in community psychology at MMU, we talk very movingly about the need not only to take care of others, but to think about the wider social relationships and also the environment. So I've, I've learned a lot from working, uh, working here, and this is the lovely duck book that we all did together, which I've got I will feature. It's a great story about the cover. It's too long to go into now, but I'll tell, I'll tell you another time. But um, alongside uh, community psychology, there have been other sorts of um, communities of practice or communities of inquiry that I have learned much from, like disability, like feminism, um, like um, ideas about learning and, and relationality. Um, one of the, uh, the authors I returned back to, to, to think about speaking out, I suppose, was Audre Lorde. I love Audre Lorde's work. I'm just going to read you something that I've just re-found again recently, which I really like. So Audre Lorde, if you didn't know, is a big feminist um, theorist, brilliant woman. So, I was going to die sooner or later, whether or not I'd even spoken myself. My silences had not protected me. Your silences will not protect you. What are the words that you do not yet have? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day? and attempt to make your own until you sicken and die of them, still in silence. We have been socialised to respect fear more than our own need for language. I began to ask each time, what's the worst thing that could happen to me if I tell this truth? And like women in other countries, our breaking silence is unlikely to have us jailed, disappeared or run off the road at night. Our speaking out will irritate some people, get us called witchy or hypersensitive, and disrupt some dinner parties. <laughs> and then our speaking out will permit other women to speak until laws are changed and lives are saved <coughs> and the world is altered forever. Next time, ask what's the worst thing that will happen? Then push yourself a little further than you dare. Once you start to speak, people will yell at you. They will interrupt you, put you down, and suggest it's personal. And the world won't end. And the speaking will get easier and you will find you have fallen in love with your own vision, which you may never have realised that you had, and you lose some friends and lovers and realise you don't miss them, and new ones will find you and cherish you, and you will still flirt and paint your nails, dress for the party, because I think as Emma Goldman said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. <laughs> and, at last, and at last, even though it's surprising and surpassing certainty that, that only one thing is more frightening than speaking your truth, and that is not speaking. Um, I, I have argued, and I think lots of people have argued that I've worked with, that we need change. And in thinking about the work of people like um, uh, Audre Lorde and Hara Arendt, who wrote a lot in The Human Condition, that Vita Activa, public life, sits at very much the core of a sustainable life. Um, she took the position that public is not simply a noun or an adjective. It's a set of commitments, it's a set of labours, it's a set of activities, solidarities, disappointments and desires. Um, the public grows deep and wide, so we need to be able to lean on each other in good times, and even more so in trying times, and these certainly are trying times. Um, Michelle Fine talks very much about these, what she calls circuits of dispossession, which, um, which kind of manipulate the way that we see the world, and which make life very difficult and more difficult for certain groups of people than others. But she also talks about capillaries of desire, and I would argue that spaces in disability studies, spaces in feminism, spaces in um, communities of practice, allow us to think through these capillaries of desire in, in a useful way. She uses a nice um, image from a science writer called Bainess, who has lectured around the globe, the globe on mighty oak trees that survive natural disaster. Bainas pulls social problems up by their roots and says, how would nature solve this? Standing tall, almost unbound, she says, oak trees grow in communities. They are expansive, bold, and they're comfortable <coughs> taking up lots of space. While they appear autonomous and freestanding, the truth is that they are held up by a thick entwined maze of roots, deep and wide. These intimate underground snuggles lean on each other for strength, even especially in times of natural disaster. 
we need to hold on and we need to cultivate these uh, these capillaries of desire. And I think Michelle Fine, Kagan and Burton have argued that as academics we're very well placed to trouble and disrupt this normativity, to, to understand what is outside the normal and to challenge and trouble and disrupt. So I guess this is something of a call to action, um, to, to be ca uh, catalytic, to try and think through collaboration <laughs> and co-production, to do what Patty Lather calls create catalytic validity in the world, to do what and do things that make a difference. Um, so change is what we need. The public intellectual is, is a way of trying to bridge this scholar activist divide and I think um, the public intellectual is not, not only engaging in civic life, but is motivated, and I love this quote, by a sense of shared humanity to be of service. So this is guided by a simple statement, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, it's it's made more academic lingo, prefigurative practice. Think about what it is, the change that you want to be, and then enact that <coughs> Um I, I'd like to come back to uh, what are some of the um, ideas behind um, professing and, and co-professing and I think lots of people have started to use this idea of the commons. The commons as being a space where connectivity, where sharing, where information happens and I know um, Ryan and Renfrew Cole and I know Tyler and, and Goodley have all started to use maybe some of these ideas around the commons as a shared space. So I guess I'd just like to invite people into this commons to co-profess and to co-produce knowledge and to think about ways in which we can make this, this world better. And, you know, if we can't create the app in 50 years, um, who knows, I might still be here then, <laughs> if I live a long time. Um, but, I, but I think we, we do need to be of service and we do need to um, think and act um, both locally and globally. So. Um, Go back to this comment. So this is the Justice for LB quilt, which uh, was one of the outcomes of the 107 Days of Action, and I think is a wonderful testimony. So um, the 107 Days of Action, either somebody did a, something um, amazing, or, or sometimes little was amazing. Um, you know, some people lopped off their hair, Dodge Julia, and other people did smaller little things like go to Glastonbury and wave a flag. Um, but lots of us were trying to raise activism and consciousness and, and, and uh, just share the message about LB. So the Commons is a space, I think, where we can co-profess and we can co-produce. And I think we all have a role to play in that. So um, we, we need to sort of change this, uh, the, the dominating messages that we get. The LB bill um, is a crowdsourced bill. So this is a bill which is trying to change the law. So now we've shifted from taking LB's memory into a practical activity. Um, and it's just at the dialogue stage. So I would urge you to have a look and see um, if you can join in the discussion. You must pledge for it, that would be really useful. Go and see your local MP um, and definitely make, make a case for why this bill needs needs to happen. We shouldn't have people who aren't included in communities. People shouldn't be sent away to places where they're not in their local communities. And this bill works with all of those things. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll end the lecture, I think, just as we um, started, started there, I think, with thinking through ways in which, without a process of conscientization, without raising awareness and changing people's consciousness, the world will stay the same. But we're all connected by a fragile set of systems, and we need to challenge that domination, I think. And I would urge you to grasp on the LB bill and Justice for LB if you just do one thing today after this, is a really important way of uh, understanding, co producing humanity and being humane in troubled times. Thank you.